There have been a number of top secret projects in space to advance human civilization, but often the interests of specific groups of individuals win out, like sending spies into space, nuking the moon, or even covering the earth in a giant ring of copper. Let's take a look at five previously top secret space projects and the impact they had on humanity. In the 1950s, at the beginning of the Cold War, an era marked by intense rivalry between the United States and the Soviet Union, the U.S. Air Force had a devious idea. If they detonated a nuclear weapon on the moon, it would not only be a victory in the space race, but also in the nuclear arms race. It would be a display of American excellence that would intimidate the Soviets and potentially give the United States an upper hand in the ongoing Cold War. If the plan had proceeded, the flash from the detonation would have been visible from Earth, creating a spectacle for everyone gazing at the night sky. The plan was to detonate the nuclear device on the moon's twilight zone, the region of the lunar surface between the illuminated and dark sides, for maximum visibility. At the core of this plan, the US military believed that a nuclear explosion on the moon would have been a highly successful show of force, considerably embarrassing the Soviets on the international stage and boosting confidence in the US-led world order. The Air Force had a team of scientists evaluating the theoretical outcomes of the nuclear explosion, including Carl Sagan. Despite the theoretical feasibility, the project faced significant ethical and environmental concerns. Scientists questioned the wisdom of using the moon, a celestial body of great scientific interest and potential future exploration, as a testing ground for nuclear weapons. There were fears about contaminating the lunar environment and the unknown long-term effects of a nuclear explosion in space. But this was during a time that we had just developed nuclear weapons and were only beginning to understand them. Counterintuitively, blowing up a nuclear bomb on the moon posed no risk to humans. The nuclear bomb intended for the moon would have been just a small 1.7 kiloton device, several times smaller than the Hiroshima bomb. The explosion would have paled in comparison to other asteroid impacts the moon has endured likely leaving behind a crater invisible from Earth. Radioactivity would not have been a concern either, given that the moon is 238,900 miles away from Earth. Nevertheless, the plan never moved forward because the Air Force believed, at the time, that the potential dangers outweighed the benefits and determined that a lunar landing would have more significant appeal to the American and global public. Project A-119, as the plan was known, remained classified until the year 2000, after nearly 45 years of secrecy. The declassification only occurred after a formal Freedom of Information request was made about the project due to some leaked information. There is no hope that this experiment will be considered in the near future for anyone hoping to look at the sky and see a nuclear explosion. After nuclear superpowers recklessly experimented with their nuclear weapons in space in tests now referred to as high-altitude nuclear explosions, the practice of detonating nuclear devices in space was banned by the Partial Nuclear Test Ban Treaty in 1963 and the Outer Space Treaty in 1967. Nonetheless, one can't help but harbor a clandestine longing for a moonlit nuclear spectacle where the world watches in awe a carefully orchestrated, entirely safe, of course it is the US government after all, and utterly audacious explosion lighting up the lunar surface. In December of 2004, NASA Special Agent Dan Oakland was wandering the halls of the launch complex at Cape Canaveral, Florida, along with a security guard by the name of Henry Butler. The two had found themselves in a dark corner of the complex that had been forgotten for some time. They stumbled across a dark, locked room that hadn't been opened in many decades. Inside, they found dust, mold, rats, and also a large box. 
With their curiosity piqued, they opened up the box, only to find something confounding. Two blue spacesuits, with the nameplates 007 and 008. Blue was never the color of any official spacesuit in the U.S. space program, nor was it typical for suits to be labeled with these numbers. It was clear that the suits weren't from the Mercury program, or Gemini, or even Apollo. The discovery of the suits was notable enough that it caught the attention of journalists and space historians alike. The suit labeled 008 also had something else written on it. A name. Lawyer. It was determined that the name was likely that of Richard E. Lawyer, an Air Force test pilot who had some dealings with NASA, but was, in fact, never an astronaut. Researchers in 2015 finally searched through newly declassified Pentagon documents to find that Lawyer was, in fact, one of 17 astronauts set to launch into space in the 1960s as part of a secret military space program. The predecessor to this secret mission was named Corona, a secret spy satellite space program designed to take imagery of Soviet military bases. The secret satellites were data-gathering successes, but they did have some major flaws. The camera technology was flawed, and recovering the film from the satellites was hit or miss. All of the satellites were unmanned, and the Corona missions were ultimately considered a strategic failure. But out of that failure came an idea. Put spies into space aboard secret capsules that could take better pictures and gather better information about the Soviets. Called the Manned Orbiting Laboratory, or MOL, the mission outlined an orbiting craft that could deploy spies into space and serve as a docking hub for the U.S. military's space program. However, while this was the secret intention of the program, NASA and the military declared that the program was really just one of the next steps to get man to the moon as a cover to the public. The idea of secretly having spies in space gathering secret information may sound absurd, but if you know anything about the ideas of the US military during the Cold War, this was one of the tamer ones. The mole was built, and it housed a camera system that was of higher resolution and higher technology than any camera system that was in existence at the time. After the mole was built, the military worked with NASA to launch the capsule into space aboard the Gemini rockets available to them at the time. On November 3rd, 1966, NASA launched one of the first prototypes of the mole missions in an unmanned mission to test whether their group of imposters or spies, could be sent into space. While the first unmanned mission was a success, the mole program was unexpectedly cancelled shortly after by President Nixon in 1969, likely due to better satellite imaging technology being developed. Theoretically, this cancellation came before any spies were put into space. Theoretically. As for the imposters, or astronauts, or spies, that were planning on launching with the Mole missions, Richard Lawyer returned to the Air Force shortly after the cancellation. But there was another name on the secret mission roster that was notable. It was that of Richard Truly. Truly, now a former space spy, eventually became the administrator of NASA in 1989. All of this mystery surrounding these secret space missions is ripe. For conspiracy. While the 008 suit was correlated to Richard Lawyer, the original wearer of the 007 suit is still unknown. The true intentions of the Mole program were declassified to the public in 2015 by the Pentagon, but much is still unknown about what actually took place back then in this top secret mission. Did the US really send spies into space under the guise of doing mundane research for the space race, or were there never imposters in space and the mission really was cancelled like the government says it was. You be the judge. Every Russian cosmonaut that flew between 1986 and 2006 carried a gun with them to protect against bears. That statement is 100% factual, but also raises some interesting questions. To start, were these space bears? Or were the Russians simply concerned a bear would sneak into the Soyuz capsule? Because it is Russia, after all, and that does seem plausible. But no, in reality, Russian cosmonauts carried guns into space for one likely scenario. 
re-entry into Earth's atmosphere. The Russian space agency was very concerned about their re-entry process. The capsule traveled at 25,000 kilometers per hour, a speed so fast that one slight miscalculation and the capsule could land in the middle of the Siberian wilderness, where there do happen to be quite a few, you guessed it, bears. But this wasn't all theory. It actually happened. In 1965, the Voskhod 2 mission carrying Pavel Bolyaev and Alexei Leonov landed 240 miles off course in the forests of Siberia. The cosmonauts were luckily carrying a 9mm pistol, but Leonov, being a true Russian, knew this wouldn't stop a bear. So they helped the Russian space agency create something known as the Taz-82. This was a triple barrel 40 gauge shotgun with a detachable machete stock that could also fire signal flares. This thing was straight out of an apocalypse movie. The Taz-82 became part of the Soviet and Russian survival kit carried on all space missions from 1986 to 2006. But why isn't it still used? Well, all of the ammo went bad. Apparently, all of the ammunition created for the Taz went bad in 2007, and nobody really knew how to make any more, so the tool was retired. After this, cosmonauts simply started to carry regular pistols into space, and they still do today. That doesn't seem like a bad idea at all. Apollo astronauts launched explosive mortars on the moon's surface in the 1960s and 70s. They brought mortars from Earth on the Apollo missions to fire off for fun. Well, not entirely for fun, but definitely in the name of scientific research. Which is fun, if you ask me. Or apparently NASA. The astronauts weren't testing moon mortars as some sort of secret government defense system, rather they were used to discover the structure of the moon's interior and subsurface. While we know a vast amount about the layers of the Earth, we knew very little about the makeup and subsurface structure of the moon. By launching and exploding mortars on the moon, they were able to record and examine seismic waves and how they moved through the moon. By measuring the slight variations in these waves, the astronauts and subsequent scientists were able to determine the structure of the moon. This is a process called active seismic imaging, or seismic tomography. Because the moon doesn't have a ton of natural earthquakes, or rather moonquakes, for the astronauts to have recorded, they had to create their own. The mortar system was developed to produce a thump throughout the surface of the moon to be picked up by finely tuned sensors. The thump was produced by a rocket-propelled grenade mortar system that was brought to the moon on Apollo 14 and 16. The system would fire grenades several kilometers from the launch site and record the waves in the moon's surface that came back. In fact, thanks to some malfunctions in the Apollo 14 tests, several grenades filled with 45 to 450 grams of hexanitrostyle bean explosive have been left on the lunar surface. Perhaps future astronauts can use them to defend against alien attack. Thanks to these experiments though, and thanks to the use of grenades on the moon, we now understand much more about the subsurface structure of Earth's largest satellite. There haven't been any more seismic experiments on the moon since Apollo, and currently there aren't any more planned. But now, thanks to explosives, we understand so much more about how the moon works.